Judge George C. Paris presiding. You may be seated. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. We're hearing the matter of Terrence Campbell v. Ross Township in Ross Township, Lake County, Indiana, at all 45 CL 10907 CT 127. Who's here on behalf of who? Kevin Allen and Tom Brown. Okay. Nick Perry's here on the phone. All right. Are we ready to proceed? Yes. Is there a settlement? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Judge. To bring the court up to date and place our hearing today in context, the present matter before the court arises out of the Hidden Lake Bridge collapse that occurred back on July 4th, 2009. In September of 2009, the court certified this matter as a class action, taking all the people that were injured or had emotional distress claims arising out of the bridge collapse class members. Since the time that the class was certified, the parties retained liability experts, engaged in discovery, and from our standpoint, Your Honor, it was difficult in that we were trying to identify class members, locate them, and then get their discovery responses to the defendants. That took a great deal of time in locating those members. After the substantial discovery was completed, the parties went to mediation before Richard McDevitt in May of 2014. We attempted to settle the case with the mediator's assistance at that time, but were unable to do so. Following the mediation, the parties continued to negotiate through the mediator and attempt to resolve this matter. The parties finally agreed on a proposed settlement in December of 2014, at which time we then filed a joint motion for approval of the settlement. We had a hearing in the court, this court, in February, at which time the court approved the form of notice to the class regarding the proposed settlement and also approved the allocation procedure for the distribution of the settlement money. What has occurred since February 2005 is that pursuant to the court's order, we mailed notice of the proposed settlement to the class members and we published notice in a local newspaper. There are, by my count, 84 persons who will share in the settlement proceeds. Of these 84 persons, four filed objections. There was Mr. Hardesty and his girlfriend, Denise Hall, Diane Marquardt, and her son, Daley Marquardt. So of the 84 claimants, only four posed an objection. The objection basically is they believe that their individual injuries somehow support a higher settlement figure. The settlement figure that we reached in this case, Your Honor, was $900,000. Now, to reach that figure and to reach agreement on it, we considered a number of factors, and that included the liability situation in this case, but the primary concern was the damages in the case. We had to consider the pre-existing conditions of the class members, what complaints were made the day of the accident, what treatment they received the day of the accident, what their follow-up treatment was, was there any delay in seeking treatment, when were complaints first made, and when were new complaints first made. We had to determine whether the mechanism of injury was consistent with the injuries claimed, and we had to determine medical causation. We had the medical records reviewed by a medical consultant to come to our 
opinion regarding the settlement. We also had to take into account the credibility of the various class members, whether they made inconsistent statements in the discovery or within their medical records, whether they appear to be malingering or exaggerating their claims, and what effect one claimant's testimony may have on the claims of another. We also considered settlements in similar cases. We also considered the uh, expenses to the class in proceeding to trial and comparing that with the likely result and how that compares to the settlement that we re reached here. After careful consideration of all these factors and others, uh, three experienced uh, attorneys in personal injury litigation, Mr. Allen, Mr. Paralisi, and uh, Richard McDevitt, all agreed that a reasonable and fair settlement of all the claims in this case is a sum of $900,000. And <clears throat> the issue today is whether that settlement is fair and reasonable. Now, as class counsel, I'm reluctant to go into the specific injuries of the objectors simply because I don't want to be placed in a position where uh, I'm attacking my own client's uh, damages. We, but I can tell the court that we evaluated what they said and we reviewed the medical records and that was all part of the uh, analysis in determining that the settlement was fair and reasonable from our viewpoint. Now, <clears throat> the way the settlement was uh, worked out as far as uh, what happens next, Your Honor, assuming the court finds that the settlement is in fact fair and reasonable, uh, what will occur then is uh, after uh, reduction of the attorney's fees and the uh, litigation costs, which are approximately $40,242, $0.43, Judge McDevitt is going to perform his analysis again regarding all the various claimants, their medical uh, information. If he needs to speak to them, he will speak to them. And he will determine an individual allocation from the remaining funds that will be paid to the various claimants. That will take place uh, in due course following uh, a determination by this court that the settlement is in fact uh, fair and reasonable. Then procedure-wise, what would occur is that uh, the settlement check would be payable to our office based upon the allocation. We would issue checks to the class members uh, in the amount of their uh, allocation as determined by the uh, neutral judgment debtor. So, Your Honor, with these three experienced attorneys uh, evaluating this case and coming to the same conclusion that the settlement is reasonable based upon the known information, we would request that the court uh, enter an order today finding that the settlement is fair and reasonable and the best interest of the class in order the parties to proceed with uh, allocating the settlement pursuant to the uh, settlement agreement. And it should also be noted, Your Honor, that this class is a no opt-out class, meaning it's all or none. So I think it would be unfair to the 80 class members who wish to proceed with the settlement to kibosh the entire settlement because four individuals believe that they uh, may be entitled to more money. Um, the settlement is fair and reasonable in our view. We would request that the court so far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. On behalf of the defendants, um, as counsel mentioned, this was uh, certified as a class with respect to any persons who allegedly suffered injuries on the bridge, emotional distress on the bridge on that particular night. Uh, that issue was litigated. Uh, all of that was resolved uh, by this court. And since that time, we have conducted significant discovery to understand 
the number of class members, the nature and extent of their claims, the liability issues, all those things that we've done through formal discovery processes, written discovery, document discovery, just some depositions of some of the class members where we believe that there were some disputed medical causation issues and we disputed the nature and extent of some of their injuries. Um, all of that took place uh, in the last uh, few years as we proceeded with litigation. Um, we determined that there were 84 class members that answered discovery responses. The majority of those class members, Your Honor, had minor injuries. Typically, um, what happened is they, when, they, when the fish from the bridge collapsed, they fell into the water below, and they suffered typically bumps, bruises, cuts, that type of thing. In some of the cases, they received medical treatment, emergency um, room treatment, they were discharged in a couple of hours after they arrived. In some cases, people didn't even see any medical treatment at all. So for the vast majority of these class members, 84 persons, uh, their medical uh, expenses are less than $1,000, and in some cases, zero. Uh, there were a handful of um, class members who were claiming more significant injuries, and those were some of the ones we proposed. And um, again, I'm sort of in a similar position, a little bit different in terms of what I can convey to the court, because we are still at this point in litigation until the settlement is approved, but I can tell you that uh, of the four objectors, um, we had significant questions about their um, the credibility of their claims, with regard to Diane Marquard, uh, she is claiming significant injuries, including brain injuries. Uh, she provided a uh, written response to the court addressing some of those. Uh, now that we disputed all of those injuries, continue to dispute those in this case. In fact, in looking at her medical records, which we obtained, uh, she had uh, multiple prior head injuries, uh, which she had uh, uh, allegedly some type of uh, brain injury. There was one in 1995, where she hit her head, uh, still beat her head, while she was taking down a tank in the military. In 1996, she uh, suffered a head injury when she was fighting over a beer, uh, when she was pushed in the sidewalk and hit her head. In 2006, she was involved in a motor vehicle, a motorcycle accident, where she was not wearing her helmet, and she hit, uh, she was hit in the head, um, and they did a CT uh, scan at the hospital. Uh, she also had, uh, through this discovery, uh, we determined that she was disabled prior to the accident. She had pre-existing uh, injuries and conditions, including chronic arthritic pain, degenerative joint disease, chronic headaches, uh, pre-existing fibromyalgia, PTSD, um, and the list goes on and on. Um, so all those are you know, the complaints she has in this case. So our position with regard to those injuries is that, that those are related to pre-existing issues and have nothing to do with uh, the, what happened here in this time where so most of these people have uh, you know, the medical records suffered very minor injuries. So we disputed her claim um, on all those grounds. With regard to her son, Bailey Marquardt, uh, he went to the emergency room that night. Uh, they uh, looked at his knee, he had some abrasions. Uh, it was really uh, nothing more than that. He was released. Uh, there was some claim uh, in the recent objections to the court with regard to this claim that he, um, he was hospitalized for psychiatric uh, reasons. Um, we have no indication that that is accurate. Uh, we have uh, obtained the answers to interrogatories from um, his mother, signed off on uh, under oath on the answers to interrogatories, and the only indication is that he had seen a uh, counselor for a short time. But there was no indication that he had ever received any type of um, psychiatric uh, 
treatment on an inpatient basis, so he was hospitalized when he was in a psychiatric condition. So I clearly dispute that um, if there is any such evidence, and we haven't seen it, other than some statement made just uh, unilaterally, and we have not seen any records indicating that. When we asked for those records, we received information, but none of that information was provided. So to the extent it even exists, we would question whether it's related in terms of timing, you know, when did that occur, all those things that we haven't seen any evidence to support that. And with regard to the other two objectors, we need to hear today. Charles Sardesti and his girlfriend did his fall. We deposed them. Again, those were two of the people we had some questions about in terms of medical causation, and that's why we deposed them. Um, Mr. Sardesti talked about significant disabilities and his objections, including claims of a permanent disability because of neck and lower back injuries. And his inability to work and attend to uh, activities of daily life. We again obtained, in addition to food, we took a we obtained his medical records we determined that there was some indication that he was actually jumping up and down on the bridge prior to the incident. That was in some of the incident records that we obtained. Um, there was an indication that he had degenerative disc disease of a moderate uh, nature at the time uh, he went to the emergency room. So our position is that he had pre-existing degenerative changes at the time of this incident. And he's trying to attribute those to this particular accident. So we, our position is that there are significant medical causation issues with regard to his condition, and in particular, after he's released from the hospital, uh, the ER, where he's not admitted, uh, he does not seek further medical treatment until a year later. So again, in addition to the pre-existing nature of the condition, uh, we have questions about the timing of any continued complaints following the incident. And there's numerous other issues, I don't want to get into too much detail because um, we are still in litigation at this point, so I want to give the judge some understanding of what some of these issues are regarding these four objectives. With regard to Denise Hall, uh, she also made an objection. It's very similar in terms of Her complaints, fibromyalgia, nerve damage, tinnitus in the right ear, which is affected 80% of the skin, uh, arthritis in the right hip, bulging disc, herniated discs in the low back, and spine, pinched nerve in the neck, knee uh, issues, all that's in her objections. Um, and again, when we looked at the medical records, we took a deposition. And we took a deposition and we had some serious questions. We found that she did have uh, some pre existing uh, conditions. She had been diagnosed with chronic neck, back, and shoulder pain prior to the incident. She had uh, pre existing herniated uh, discs in all of the spine. She had pre existing left knee problems for which she received treatment. Uh, she had been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. No indication that is linked to the incident. The idea that she suffered hearing loss related to this incident. I don't believe that there's any really, uh, credible way that we can link up hearing loss uh, to this particular incident. So, uh, needless to say, there are over just some of the examples of the types of arguments we would make to challenge uh, the objectors coming to the settlement. As Council mentioned, there are any other uh, class members who did answer discovery in this case and uh, apparently are not objecting to the settlement. And we cited in, in our written response to the court uh, some cases uh, and what, how the court is to look at this type of proposed settlement when dealing with the class action. Uh, we cited the Indiana Supreme Court case, the Kentucky case. Here, um, the Supreme Court said that the 
court has to consider is whether the settlement agreement is fair, reasonable, and adequate as to all class members. In making this determination, the court has to consider several factors, including the degree of opposition, the strength of the case, measuring that against the terms of the settlement, the complexity, length, and expense of continued litigation, the benefit of the settlement to class representatives and their counsel compared to the benefit of the settlement to class members, the opinion of competent counsel as to the reasonableness of the settlement, and the stage of the settlement proceedings and the amount of discovery completed. And we cited in our brief, Your Honor, the Duffy case, and there's also the public court case addressing those factors that the court has to consider in these circumstances. And in those cases, they also talk about the number of class members that are disputing the settlement. The fact that you have a small number of objections to the settlement is a factor for the court to consider in determining whether that is an indication of the settlement's fairness. And those cases also talk about the fact that the court should consider and give great weight to class counsel's recommendation in favor of the settlement agreement, especially where that settlement was reached at arm's length, through arm's length negotiations. In this case, there were those arm's length negotiations. We got Judge McDevitt as an independent mediator to evaluate these claims. Both sides were vigorous in their positions to the point where at the mediation conference, we did not settle initially. I had one view. Opposing counsel had another view. But Judge McDevitt continued to work on both sides to try to get this claim resolved. He independently evaluated the claims, had the information to do that. And through continued efforts, he reached a settlement for an amount that was actually, I think, recommended and approved by Judge McDevitt. Here, if this case continues on, the cost of litigation will be substantial in terms of the number of additional work we're going to need to do through trial and through an appeal. And if it's an indicator that is a factor to consider, is if we move ahead, the cost to all the other class members who are not in opposition to the settlement. And with regard to the four objectors, the ability to determine, for them to determine independently, the settlement is unfair as the whole class, I think is difficult for them to do. They don't understand the full scope of the class. They don't understand the full scope of what their claim injuries are. But we have done that. Counsel has done that. Judge McDevitt has done that. We've all agreed that the amount of the settlement is fair and reasonable as to all class members. And a portion of those proceeds will be addressed at a later date under the scheme of the Supreme Court. So for all those reasons, Judge, we believe that the settlement is fair and reasonable and adequate as to all class members. And we would ask Your Honor to approve the proposed settlement. Thank you. We need to hear from the objectors. Sir, I think that we would have an objection to the objectors that are supported for one objection. Who's here objecting to this? Why don't you step up to the podium here one at a time? If we're being together, I guess that's OK, too. You want to come on up to the podium? Mr. 
Man, you are. What's your last? Okay. Um, my major concern is I was not aware that you not, did not have to give my son psychiatric history of inpatient consultation records. You didn't what? Have the entirety of my son's psychiatric records that I objected on because I was afraid they weren't being addressed and I did not think they're not included. That are directly related to this, I'd like to make sure that I gave a chance to get those records over. Wouldn't she give him a chance? No, sure. Or presenting them to judge the evidence to the extent that they're useful in the assessment. My concern was to make sure my son was medical, and that I would have been able to take more of him than my son was to the judge. Well, I believe that's the next step, right, as to what each person is going to get. That's when they look at those. So that's your only objection? Yes, sir. Okay. And you provide them with Mr. Allen. You make sure that they get the right people. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. Who else is objecting here? Over there. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. You are? Did you, you were objecting to this also? Yes, because over the years I've been experiencing a lot of medical problems. I have eight, like eight or nine doctors for all my problems. I uh, have fibromyalgia and made for it. They told me I had neuropathy on top of that. I have a bulky disc disease and it's also a moderate arthritis in my hip. I have yeah. my neck. Is created in different places in my back, lower back. I have pinched nerve in my in my back and everything. I have arthritis real bad in my knees, and I have bad a bad heel in my my whole right leg from the knee down to my foot turned black and blue. The next day after after the bridge collapsed, I uh, I have but uh, when. Like a, a couple days or a week or later after I was injured, I heard uh, crickets in my bedroom. I thought it was in my bedroom and it was my ear chirping. So since then, I've had tinnitus in my ear with long nerve damage, and I have medical records to prove that I've been hurting for years and years since the accident happened. The last six years, and I'm just falling apart, and I'm in a lot of pain. I can't sleep. It's hard for me to function. I can't hardly bend over and come back up without my back locking up on me and everything. And my knees hurt. I can't get on my knees. I can't do it. Was your doctor related these to the accident? Part, yes. Yes. Related these. All this to the accident? Yes. You have reports that say that from a doctor. Yes. That's not what I'm hearing from uh, counsel. They didn't see any reports that's relating all this to the well, accident. I have problems. Well, we know you have problems that are related to the accident. Yes, they are. That's what you say or that's what a doctor says? Doctors and I say. Mm -hmm. Counsel, do we have anything from a doctor? I do not. I mean, when, I, when I review the medical records, the emergency medical records, the only complaints that she had was like that. That was at, in the beginning, but things happen as they progress, and that's my problem. Well, did they get all your records? Yeah. I don't know who got my records, but, but I, re I have like eight doctors. I have a rheumatologist doctor now. And you've turned these records over to the attorneys? 
my attorney is supposed to be and his uh, assistant, Sarah, is supposed to be doing all this for us, but I feel like they're not even helping us anymore. Sure, they got your medical records, ma'am. I don't know. I think they've given up on us. That's how I feel. We, we've supplied all the all the. I feel like I've never even met my lord. My. Yeah. I'm, unfortunately, there are no medical reports establishing a cause of action between these complaints. If there were, you know, we certainly would presume. Ma'am, do you understand that you have to? Your, your complaints have to be related to the incident. Right. But and if they're not, if you don't have medical proof of that from a doctor or from a medical provider. You, I do. I have a pain management doctor, Dr. Michael Spence. Not, a, not that they're treating you. They're treating you for pain, obviously. But are they saying this pain is related to this accident? If they don't say that. Well, with, where did they come from then? Where, where did my problems come Well, from that's me? what you have to ask the doctor, right. not, not me, not Mr. Mr. Allen. Oh, no. we're trying. That's why you don't settle. Like a month after something happened, you settle, you know, later But on. still the doctor has to relate your injuries or your complaints to this accident. Yes, they do. Had Dr. Well, then it's not in the evidence. Doctors. Obviously, it's not. It's Mr. Allen, counsel, they haven't seen it. I've been. I feel like nobody cares. I did my own attorney. Is there, any, is there anyone else who has who's objecting? Is that all of them? Is, that, is there another one? Anyone else objecting to this settlement? No, I, I, I think those are all the objectors. Okay, then we're going to go ahead and approve the settlement. You want to prepare an order? All right.